So you're ready to switch to Marlin 2.0, maybe for a 32-bit mainboard, but where do you start? This video is for you. Tweaking Marlin firmware can be a fearsome barrier when you're first getting into 3D printing. I was in the same position back in 2013 when I forked the main Marlin branch with Solidoodle 2 changes to help facilitate upgrades and improvements for that printer. Back then, I was a complete novice, but over the years, I've built up experience and knowledge, and now I'm confident with Marlin firmware. The good news is, if I can do it, then you can do it too. Previously, I've made a Marlin Explained video covering the structure and function of Marlin 1.9. This video will be similar, but focused on Marlin 2.0, which is built for 32-bit mainboards. We'll cover the differences, software setup, as well as some troubleshooting. Let's go. A quick summary, we have hardware, which is our 3D printer, and then we have the software, which is Marlin. Once we install this software on the hardware, we have our installed firmware. The source for Marlin can be downloaded from the Marlin GitHub. And whether you're using the previous version 1.1.9 or the newer Marlin 2.0, all you need to change is the branch in the top left. To change between them, you simply select the dropdown, the page will reload, and then you can download a zip file with the firmware. The software required to edit Marlin version 1 was the Arduino IDE. And that's because traditionally 3D printer mainboards were based on Arduino Mega 2560s. They used 8-bit AVR-based microcontrollers, but as we can see here, Marlin 2.0 also supports much faster 32-bit and ARM-based boards, as well as maintaining support for 8-bit AVR boards. After downloading, we can compare the two. Pretty much everything you need for the old version of Marlin is inside the Marlin folder. As you can see, there's a series of files ending with .h or .cpp, and they relate to various functionality that you can turn on and off in the firmware as you're compiling it. We also have our marlin.ino file that we open in the Arduino editor. We can see for marlin 2.0 that we have additional folders. Probably the most important one here is the one that stands for .platform.io environments. Inside there, there'll be a subfolder for whatever processor you're compiling for, and inside that, you'll find your actual firmware file. We can see that both the new and old version of Marlin have a file called platformio.ini. On Marlin 1, we can leave this as default, effectively ignoring it, but on Marlin 2, we need to set it up to match the type of processor we're using. Finally, for Marlin 2.0, there's still a Marlin folder, but all of the many files that were here for Marlin 1 are now hidden inside the source folder, grouped inside subfolders depending on their function. This means it is slightly harder to find things but it also keeps the folder structure much tidier. To edit the firmware source for Marlin version 1, we simply had to double click the marlin.ino file and the Arduino IDE would open with all of our files accessible. For Marlin 2.0, unless you're still compiling for an AVR 8-bit board, we need to download a different software package. We have two main options. One of these is Atom, and that is the open source text editor as recommended by GitHub. We also have Microsoft Studio Code, which should work the same way, is free, but for this video I'm going to stick with Atom, because it is the editor used in all of the documentation for Marlin. So Atom has just installed and I see no harm in letting it handle Atom links. So we're going to click yes always, and then immediately we're going to come up to file, settings, and we're going to install the platform IO add-on. To do that we're going to come to install, and we're going to type in platform. This is the one we want here, the IDE, so let's click install and wait for that to complete. Partway through the install, you'll be asked to install Clang, which is completely normal and all part of the process. We're going to install it, once again keeping with the default options. A web page will load and we're prompted to install Clang 3.9.1. The file has downloaded and I'm installing it and there's only one setting I need to get right, and that's selecting the second option from here. After that's done, it's going to prompt us for a restart back in Atom, so we'll click the button and do just that. Okay, you'll notice when we're back inside that we have a platform I.O. menu, and we also have a toolbar down the left-hand side. 
Another piece of software that I was originally missing and gave me errors was the Git client. So save yourself some head scratching later on and download and install this now. I've just finished installing Git and I've used all of the default settings. We don't need to launch it afterwards. It's just gonna run in the background when required. With our software installed, we can now do our final step before opening up the source. We're going to save some time by replacing the default configuration files for one of a specific printer, in this case the Ender 3. For our Ender 3, we can come into configuration and then examples, scroll down to Creality, and then come in and copy the files for Ender 3. We'll now come back up into the Marlin folder and paste and overwrite the two files there. Back in Atom and Platform IO, we're going to open a project. Our job is to select the folder that everything is contained in. And just be sure that that folder contains the file platformio.ini. So on this left hand panel here, we have our project listed. And if we expand the Marlin folder, we have our configuration files, as well as inside the source, all of the other files that make up Marlin. Before we configure anything in Marlin, however, we need to configure this platform io.ini file. Now you'll see by default, the environment is set to mega 18 mega 2560. When we scroll down further into the file, we can see all of the possible environments highlighted in blue. Your main board documentation should tell you which one you need, so select it and copy. Come back up the top and paste it over the top of the previous value. This value is correct for an SKR 1.3. Other 32-bit boards may have a different value and this is generally found on their product page or data sheet. One other thing worth mentioning is that the names of the available platforms have changed over time. For instance, the Big Tree Tech SKR Mini used to be called that. You can see here it's declared with a different name, but generally if you search for what you're after, there'll be comments there guiding you towards the right parameter. Moving on from platformio.ini, the main two files that you'll be editing are configuration.h and configuration underscore adv or advanced.h. Clicking once on these will open them up in the current tab, or double clicking will open them up alongside each other in separate tabs. This video is all about a general understanding. So we'll start with defines. Anywhere that we see a define, we're either enabling a feature or setting a parameter in the firmware. For instance here, there's one extruder, but if you were to set up the firmware for a dual extrusion machine, you would change this to two. Just below this, we have the example of defining a feature in the firmware, and you can see it's grayed out, and that's because it's a comment. These two slashes at the front tell the firmware to ignore everything that follows. You'll notice here that it says if enabled Mark II multiplexer, and that means all of the code between the if and the end if will only be read and included in the compiled firmware if the matching define line is uncommented. The firmware generally has pretty good documentation in build. For example here, temperature sensor 0 or the main hot end is set to 1. If we scroll up just above that, we can see that that equates to 100k thermistor and that's the most common choice on most 3D printers. The other thing you might sometimes see is a value set using words instead of numbers. And that means that earlier in the firmware, a number has already been set for this and it's substituted in. In this case, bang max is set directly above at 255. And therefore, when the firmware is compiled, PID max is going to be set to 255 exactly as if we had typed it in manually. One last note is that when we're setting parameters, not only can we refer to existing values, but we can also do some simple maths. For instance, here in the probing section, the initial probe is set to whatever the homing feed rate Z speed is, and then the slow probe is that value divided by two. When the firmware is compiled, anything like this will have the value substituted in, and then the equation solved. Beyond these two main files, quite often you might need to visit other files such as the pin file for your mainboard. To find that, we open up source, then come to pins, and then where you go from there will depend on your board, this firmware is for an SKR version 1.3, which is LPC 1768. And then in here we can see we have our board and we can double click it to open it, checking values or making alterations as we need to. When we're finished setting our parameters and uncommenting features that we want included in our firmware build, we come up to the tick to compile it. 
Now all of that can happen very quickly, but if there is an error, the message box will remain down the bottom. We can bring it back by pressing F8, and then we can review what happened. One of the nice things about this setup for Marlin 2.0 is that any dependencies are automatically downloaded and included. Whereas previously, in the Arduino editor, we needed to install these libraries manually. Our next important information is the size of the data and program. Generally, 32-bit boards have a lot more flash space on them to fit the firmware, and that explains why in this case we're using easily under half the available space. It is completely normal for the status to be ignored for every environment except for the one that you specified in platformio.ini. With Marlin 1 and an 8-bit board, we used to connect the computer and the printer directly with a USB cable and then upload the firmware directly from the Arduino IDE. This is assuming our main board already had a bootloader in place, which some definitely did not. When using a 32-bit board with Marlin 2.0, we typically have to retrieve the SD card from the main board. On some boards, like the SKR version 1.3, you can still plug in the computer to the main board directly via USB. In either case, a drive will appear on your computer with a file inside called firmware.cur for current. We can now place our firmware on this drive. If we come back to our firmware folder and then come inside the platform IO environments folder, inside the one that we've built for, we'll find a firmware.bin file and we can copy that to the USB drive that comes up and then reset the printer. An easier thing to do is to simply hit the upload button and it should look for that drive and transfer the file for you automatically. We can see that it's put the new firmware file in place. So all we need to do now is to power cycle the printer or hit the reset button. We can see that the drive disappears as it's rebooting. And when it's done, the binary file has disappeared because it has been flashed to the printer. And now our current firmware is represented by the firmware.cur for current file. On some boards such as the SKR Mini, sometimes this file isn't deleted and you should reinsert the SD card, delete it manually to stop the firmware from being updated on every power on. Before we move on, a quick recap. Marlin 1 was only suitable for 8-bit boards, but Marlin 2 supports these as well as 32-bit. Marlin 1 used the Arduino IDE, but Marlin 2, when you use a 32-bit board, needs either Atom or VS Code with the Platform I.O. plugin. Marlin 2 has its files organized into subfolders instead of just one, and it also automatically includes dependencies and libraries when compiling. Marlin 1 was flashed directly to the main board via USB, but for Marlin 2, when working with a 32-bit board, we place the firmware.bin file on the SD card and then reset. So far, we've talked about what happens if everything goes right, but now let's cover some errors. One general step you can undertake when you have bugs was to come to the platform IO menu and rebuild all of the project indexes. Another fairly common problem is to enable so many features in the firmware that you run out of program space on the processor. This will prompt you for a message about the ROM being overflowed by a certain amount of bytes. The only way to make more room is to disable features that you aren't using. This graphic shows some low hanging fruit of items you can probably remove without consequence. The exact numbers would have changed since then, but the process is the same. For instance, arc support. We go control F to find and then type in arc and search until we find the section. Simply add two slashes on the front to uncomment this out. And as it says, it's gonna save a certain amount of bytes. Simply keep on removing unwanted features until you get the file size where you need it. Other times you might be trying to enable a feature, but you leave something out. Scrolling up will give you a lot of error messages, and fortunately they're fairly descriptive, even though they're repeated over and over. Here I've put in the steps for filament runout detection, but purposely left something out, and it's giving me the error that advanced pause requires nozzle park feature. I can close this and then control F to search. If you can't find it in one of the tabs, switch to the other one and repeat your search. We know that Marlin wants this to be enabled, so we're simply going to delete the comments and it should fix the problem. One annoying problem I've had from time to time is errors saying that it can't load some of these common dependencies. After a lot of Googling, I was able to find a solution. Unfortunately, it was an easy fix. One that commonly failed for me was Sailfish LCD. And you can see by default in Marlin, the address ends with slash archive slash master dot zip. I was able to fix it by removing everything after Sailfish LCD and instead writing dot git. 
If you're having inexplicable errors with dependencies, this is something easy that you can try. It might get you over the line, and if not, you can always undo and resave. A really strange one that I've had from time to time is that when I go to compile, I have an error message down the bottom. I can't remember the exact wording, but something along the lines of not knowing what platform IO is. As strange as it is, the fix is really easy by simply closing down the editor and reopening it again, which has fixed that problem every occasion for me. Hopefully this video can help build some confidence so you can start tweaking Marlin firmware to your liking. Now I did have some requests for troubleshooting and I've done the best that I can here, but please keep in mind it's very hard for me to cover problems that I haven't experienced myself firsthand. It's also well worth browsing or searching the issue section on GitHub. You might be able to find a solution straight away, or if not, know that your problem is a bug that is being worked on. If you do get stuck, then copy and paste your error message into Google and it'll give you another chance to learn. You can also watch videos on channels like mine, so subscribe if you don't want to miss out on future guides just like this one. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.